neither of us work for the Commission any longer. Ask the first news. <laughs> we work in the European External Action Service, which is uh, a separate entity to the Commission. Um, and it's, it, 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 it is an important evolution because up until now I've always spoken for the Commission. The Commission has a very clear line of involved. Now then, the External Action Service, uh, we no longer represent the Commission, we represent the EU, which means the Commission and the Member States. So that uh, very much changes the sort of uh, work that we do and the positions that we take on us. So uh, I can take some questions on it for you all with uh, the details. What I'd like to do is just to run through what is the, the policy towards Zimbabwe, um, what are we doing uh, for Zimbabwe, um, and perhaps run through uh, the, the, the reason behind and the consequences of the recent rollover of the measures uh, against Zimbabwe, or against certain Zimbabwe. Before I get into that, I would just like to say um, how much I appreciate being invited here. Uh, civil society in Zimbabwe has probably been the key actor for the European Union. Um, we listen very carefully to what civil society has to say, all parts of civil society. Uh, civil society is very important in shaping our policy. So, although I will explain to you what our policy is, I'd be particularly interested to hear your response to that. And civil society also is um, probably now our principal actor in terms of what we're able to achieve in Zimbabwe. And as you will hear, we have um, since the first introduced measures against Zimbabwe, we have um, made available well over a billion euros, a lot of which is due to the society. So, first of all, what is our policy towards Zimbabwe? Our policy changed when the current government was. Uh, came to be. In the sense that we decided to uh, open political relations with the government, political relations which have been moribund for the six previous years. Uh, we opened a dialogue with the government. We uh, appreciate the fact that in that dialogue the government sent three principles, one from each of the parties, which meant that we were able to listen to uh, the representatives of those who had been elected by the Zimbabwe people. Uh, and that also obviously uh, very much shaped uh, uh, our policy towards the country. After the first meeting which took place almost two years ago now, uh, there was uh, an agreement that we would work on what we call the Schmidt Roadmap approach, which was that we would prepare a roadmap for the normalization of our relations with Zimbabwe, and there would be a number of clear steps in that uh, process. We also uh, agreed that the government would prepare uh, on its side a roadmap, and that roadmap would be for the full implementation of the, the CPA. Uh, we would then build linkages between the steps which the government was going to take to fully implement the CPA and the steps which the union was going to take to normalizing relations. And as the government advanced, we would advance, as we advanced, the government would advance. So there was a parallelism, let me say, between the two. Uh, tasks which we set, which we each set ourselves. Uh, I would say now that probably that that uh, approach was a failure in the sense that there was insufficient dialogue which we were able to create in Harare between our heads of mission and the representatives of the government in order to find who would do what and when, and how these two things would be. Um, 
that failure was more or less um, uh, confirmed in the meetings which took place last year between representatives of the three parties and Catherine Ashton. And so we then moved rather on to a different way. It was then felt that probably, uh, although the, this government had achieved uh, a number of quite remarkable things in certain areas, uh, there had been uh, a remarkable recovery of the economy. Uh, there had also been uh, quite a bit of progress in what we call the, the regalian obligations of a government. In other words, basic services were beginning to come on stream. Quite a lot of uh, achievements have been made. But there was very little achievement on the political side, uh, and there was very little uh, which should be done in order to move the country towards credible elections. There were, uh, we saw that there were, uh, despite the assurances that we had from the three parties that they remained a very strong and united government, we could see that there were clear uh, tensions which were building up between the parties and the government. And so we rather switched our policy from the full implementation of the GPA more towards looking at uh, how could one move the country towards, or how could we support the country moving towards credible elections. And that uh, credible elections probably would be the best uh, way out of what appears to be developing into a political uh, without progress being made in the necessary areas. Now then, uh, we came to that conclusion, and I think that uh, a number of the Saudi countries, in particular South Africa, came to the same conclusion. And we were very encouraged when we saw uh, Zuma engaging personally in, uh, in this effort to try to help the country to create the conditions for credible elections. So we more or less decided that we would use our influence our leverage, if you like, in support of the work which was being done by Salik in general and uh, South Africa. Um, we were then approached by South Africa. We had a summit with South Africa last year, and Zuma put in very clear terms to Catherine Ashton what he wanted the EU to do in support of their attempts to Zimbabwe towards political elections. Uh, that was very clear. He said, you have, to, you have to move on the sanctions. Uh, if you move on the sanctions, then that will reinforce our hand. Uh, and so this started uh, a, a very in-depth debate within the uh, as to how we should react to this request from Zuma, which was echoed, by the way, by each of the three uh, uh, principles of the political parties, and how we could move in support of this attempt by South Africa to move in Bali towards Britain. Unfortunately, when we came towards a decision point, then we really didn't see that things were moving in a conv convincingly in the right direction. And so we decided that probably it would be better essentially just simply to roll over our measures so that the full leverage remains uh, in place. Uh, but that at the same time we will pass a message saying that we were ready to review that position at any time as soon as we could see that there was credible progress in this process of negotiation led by South Africa. Uh, and that is that remains the position today. Uh, the member states of the Union also uh, said that they would like the external action service, that's where we work now of the European Union to engage very closely with South Africa uh, and with SADC in order to get a better understanding of this process and to get a better understanding of how we produce our leverage and support it and that 
such that if there were to be some uh, uh, reasonable progress, then we would be able to react immediately in a supportive way, uh, as requested by South Africa and by the Mexicans. But that, in a like nutshell, is our position. We haven't taken questions on that. Perhaps I should also just say a word about the, the, the support which the Union has been giving to Zimbabwe. Um, since 2002, the European Union has actually uh, made one and a half thousand million euros available to Zimbabwe, most of which uh, is now committed and uh, spent. This has been channeled very largely through uh, civil society in Zimbabwe, 